Hello and welcome to the Bradley Men's Basketball pregame show at home edition, if you will, with Larry Larson and Mitch Kaminsky. I'm Joey Wright. And guys, we've got a, a pretty full show coming up today. We're going to recap the non-conference portion of Bradley's schedule and get into the Valley. But first, uh, happy holidays. You know, how, how were the holidays? How was, uh, you know, whatever holiday you celebrate? You know, I, I hope you guys had a good one. Yeah, you too, Joey. It's good to see everybody. It's been a while since when was our last show? October, previewing the season. But here we are. We've come a long way. Holidays were good. Of course, lots of college basketball to watch. Yeah, a little different this year, obviously, with the COVID and all. But uh, as always, it was uh, it was a fun holiday. And yeah, like you said, the sports are back. You know, we had football to watch. The NBA was back. And a lot of college basketball uh, to discuss, including some big Bradley games uh, over the break. So can't wait to get started talking about them. A lot of good sports, as Mitch said. I think this is the season that I finally get into playing uh, fantasy basketball, a little fantasy NBA action. So my team's off to an iffy start. But uh, this isn't about the pros. This is about the college level, of course. And, and Mitch, as you alluded to, a couple of, couple of big Bradley games to watch uh, over, I guess, what would be the winter break portion of the calendar. And even since uh, uh, Thanksgiving, of course, has been the, the, the brunt of Bradley's schedule, all of Bradley's schedule, in fact. And let's uh, let's dive right into it. You know, Bradley, I, we were talking before we came on the air, what, eight points away from being potentially ranked. I mean, you have a, a tough loss to Xavier, tough loss to Missouri, and a tough loss to South Dakota State. But other than that, I mean, the Braves have looked really good. And even in their three losses, I mean, they were right there with a chance to win each one of them. Yeah, they certainly were, Joey. And going into those games, I think the team expected to win those games. That's one thing that Brian Wardle has said is that there are no moral victories. And even though they lost by one point to Xavier and they lost by one point to Mizzou, it's, it doesn't feel like a win. And although that may be gut-wrenching, that's probably a good thing for the program where you go into these games and you get yourself in a position to win where it's not necessarily surprising yourself. Maybe you're surprising fan bases, but I think Bradley's success this year has not been a surprise. Yeah, you said it. I had that written down in my notes, too. Coach Wardle said there's no moral victories because when you win two NBC championships in a row, the standard kind of changes, and you're expecting to win these close games. So it was really disappointing, especially because of the fact they had that Missouri game in hand, and then they allowed 600 unanswered points in the last 93 seconds, and they fouled a guy lighting a three-point play uh, with, like, a second, one second left. So that was one that got away with them where they should have won. But I'm glad that they're upset that they, they're expecting to win these games. It shows that they're being competitive. Some small things we got to uh, fix uh, here and there. But all three losses were games I feel like they, they should have won. Like South Dakota State, they let them shoot 65% from behind the arc. And that usually doesn't happen. The team's shooting that well. It's hard to win a game like that. But they were right there. And Xavier, obviously, that came down. Uh, some couple late game uh, free throws there, which seems to have plagued this team. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of little things that can – clean up but I, i'm excited the way this team looked and they're out of conference play i think um i think it's a strong starting point for when they head into conference we talk guys about the three losses and of course those were three high profile losses uh, especially the missouri game 14th ranked team in the in the nation almost had it but let's talk about the wins of course because bradley off to a hot start i i, I think it's it's notable that we can talk about the three losses they suffered and not even talk about some of the wins i mean the toledo win uh, really buckled down and got that one done at the end, thanks uh, in large part to the efforts of Terry Nolan uh, at home against Miami, Ohio. I think that's a game that we'll look back on when the season concludes and say that was a that was a big win that kind of shaped the season. So, uh, Bradley, and then of course we've got the the two wins against non Division one teams. You know, Brian Wardle will tell you that they came out and just took care of business. They had the opportunity to get a lot of guys in in the rotation, but. Uh, focus in Larry particularly on the Toledo game that was the first game they played this season and it really set the tone I think for the Xavier game the next day for the Oakland game to follow and then uh, the early portion of the schedule as a whole oh it really did Joey that was quite the way to open the college basketball season like you said it really set the tone especially for guys like Terry Nolan and Sean East two guys who were heralded as big transfers. They were going to come in and they started right away and they lived up to expectations. Nolan playing his first game in over 600 days and really picking right up where he left off, hitting the game winner. And Sean East, he's been consistent throughout conference play. So that those are two of my biggest takeaways throughout non-conference is that, you know, these guys aren't feeling any pressure, I don't think. They're coming in and they're just playing basketball and taking care of business. And those two players have been 
you know, at the top of the box score and playing a really big role in every single one of Bradley's games. Yeah, Terry Nolan's kind of emerged as the closer for this team down the stretch. He had the big basket against Toledo at the end of the game, and he did it once again against uh, Miami of Ohio. And I think that's what really hurt him in the Missouri game is missing him down the stretch because that was kind of a, a factor there. But uh, it's a younger team. They're re- really talented. So a lot of these guys still used to how to closing out games. So uh, I like Nolan, how he's stepping up late in games and uh, putting together some clutch baskets. So I think, you know, if you have him, uh, we might not be talking about a one point loss against Mizzou because you know, he, he would have been in there helping them out, close out those games. But yeah, the, the Miami of Ohio game, especially, I thought was a really impressive victory where I didn't think they played their best game and were able to pull it out uh, near the end. So um, yeah, it was a good win for them. And then, as you said, they took care of business against the teams they were supposed to be, which is always good too, because you don't want them to sleepwalk uh, through those. Certainly. And we'll also mention a win against Jackson state Bradley all told six and three entering Missouri Valley conference play and guys, let's dive right into the Missouri Valley conference as I get a text message there, uh, <laughs> we'll dive right into the Missouri Valley Conference. Bradley, 6-3 and three entering play. Bradley was supposed to be in action already against Valparaiso, against that series. Uh, of, of course, that series, I should say, was, was postponed. A couple of COVID concerns with Valparaiso. But 6-3 and three entering a tough Missouri Valley Conference. And, guys, a lot of teams really had good first weekends of conference play. Yeah, they did, Joey. It was really fun to watch. Um, obviously, we didn't have Bradley to watch, which was a slight disappointment. But – I flipped on a few of the other games, and I would say the big winner from the first weekend, you know, a lot of teams played well, but I got to go with Evansville. They came out with the road split at SIU and won their first conference game since March of 2019. That's a relief for the Purple Aces, and all things told, that's really good for the conference. You never want a team to go through conference play and not win a game like Todd Licklider's squad did last year. So it's really good to see them come out with the win. And honestly, I don't think they're the worst team in the conference this year. That title may go to our friends down I-74. I'm going with Drake. That's a good pick, too. That's a sleeper pick right there with Evansville. So I like that one. I'm going with Drake. Uh, They smacked around Indiana State twice. The first game was pretty close. And then Drake dropped 50 on him in the second half. They shot 50% from three-point range. So that's always a good sign to see. Second game, they were down heading into halftime and once again second half adjustments they proceeded to score 48 and they turned a 29 25 deficit into a 73 66 win so i like the fact that they're coming out of these second half strong to so showing some good coaching adjustments and they improved the record at 12 and 0 so undefeated season uh which is always impressive the fact that we've won 12 games already now mind you they beat up on some cream puffs outside of uh kansas state but uh, they've had different guys step up too dj welkins in the first game 22 points and then roman penn stepped up in the second game with 21 so a lot of different guys contributing i, I thought they had a very strong uh, opening uh, weekend Drake has been so much fun to watch here and I only watched them for the first time yesterday but of course we saw them in the MVC tournament we saw guys like Roman Penn step up and then you had Liam Robbins really have a huge tournament but then he bolts so when I was looking at Drake entering the season I was thinking okay how are they going to fill that void it hasn't been a problem for him their guard play has been so strong Uh, Murphy has been really good in the front court as well. So they just have guys keep stepping up, keep stepping up. And Darren DeVries is just such a good coach. Year after year, he comes out with some sort of surprise with the Bulldogs. They were kind of down last year in MVC play, but then they won two games at Arch Madness. So you never really know what to expect um, from the Bulldogs. And I really think they're going to be a contender in this league. I agree. They're they're one of those teams kind of like – SIU last year where you don't expect them to be like a top contending team in the middle like before the season pregame or preseason predictions probably not picking them to be the top they're one of those scary teams you don't want to play late in season especially if they keep up their hot play like this Drake's a team they feel like they should be ranked of course they were the first team in the country to 10 wins at 10 and 0 now 12 and 0 and I think people look at their schedule strength of schedule a little iffy but if they keep this up into valley play they will find themselves in the top 25 and how about guys a team that had a good first weekend uh, against Illinois State that's Loyola Chicago you guys you know stole Evansville and Drake as, as two teams with the best weekends but I want to use what Loyola did against Illinois State is kind of a segue into their next series against Bradley of course January 3rd and 4th 
loyal Chicago that, you know, they came out, they, they, they were widely considered to be in the top three of the Valley. And of course now the top two, now that Northern Iowa is without AJ green took care of business against the Redbirds. And it's going to be a fun series when they come to Peoria to play the Braves on the third and fourth of January. You want to go ahead, Mitch? <laughs> I feel like I go first every time. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I mean, th- this team watched looking at them. I think what I look at is like the two losses. That's what I like to look at them with a lot of these teams and how they played in the games they lost. And they played a tough Wisconsin team uh, and they played them tough. The game kind of got away from them in the second half, but they were right there in the first half of that game. Uh, and then the other one was a heartbreaking loss to Richmond. They only lost by two points. They have a pretty good program. Uh, so that was a little bit of disappointing for them. But the two losses, they played well. And they've taken, they took care of their business uh, against Illinois State. Cameron Crutwig, obviously, we talk about him uh, every year. But he, he's, he seems to get better almost every year. He's had 15 or more points in five of his last six games. So he's kind of heating up uh, along the stretch. Started off slow his first game of the season. But uh, he's heating up. He's always tough to stop. And when you got a guy that's, uh, you know, Feel like he's playing really good basketball right now has the hot hand and, you know it's going to be important for Bradley to slow him down down low and, and Larry I was just going to ask you then what can we expect from the Braves uh, as they host the Ramblers you know January 3rd and 4th that is going to be an early that might be the the Valley series of the year throughout its you know with how the schedule's played out first weekend or second weekend those might be the games of the year early on yeah, I think this is a series that Valley fans have circled on their calendars every single year, but this year especially. As we mentioned earlier, you and I losing A.J. Green, I think that drops them kind of out of the top three consideration. We'll get into more of that later. But Loyola, obviously returning tons of experience, and Bradley returning experience, but also bringing in the new guards. And what to expect out of this series, I think, is defense. you got the top two defenses on in the league, Porter Moser always has his defense ready. And I think Brian Wardle's squad, the hallmark of this team is defense this year. I mean, they held a Xavier team to only 50 points, granted in their second game of the season, but the Musketeers have scored somewhere around 80 points in almost every single one of their other games. And they've done it against high-level competition. And so the Braves' defense, they're battle-tested. And you can say the same for Loyola, of course, because Mitch mentioned their strength of schedule playing Wisconsin and Richmond. So I'm expecting two defensive games, especially in that second game when players may be running out of stamina playing the second game in two days. Another thing I'm looking for is three-point shooting. Uh, Loyola so far this season, they're shooting 44% from beyond the arc. Bradley down near 31%, but we know that this team likes to shoot the three. Um, and missing Terry Nolan has, you know, a little bit of an effect on that. Um, maybe we'll see the Braves go inside a little bit more, less shooting around the perimeter, but but that's going to be a huge key for the Braves is locking down the perimeter and making sure Cameron Crutwig, you know, doesn't get the ball in the post and isn't able to find those outlet passes around the arc. And defensively for the Braves, I mean, that's really what they've been hanging their hat on this season. As you mentioned, they're holding opponents to 59 points per game. So that's going to win you a lot of games, especially in the Valley where the scoring, you know, uh, is harder to come by. You're, you're holding teams down to like that. that that's going to help them out. And as far as the Braves go in these close games, cause I do think it'll be a close game. They had some barn burners against Loyola last year, um, especially the one at home. And, you know, I feel like we mentioned it every year. It feels like a pot shot, but the free throw shooting's got to get better. Like the Xavier game, they were two from six of the line. You make two more of those, you're going to win that game. Uh, and then the uh, Missouri game, uh, five for 10 from the three throw line. Uh, that's kind of inexcusable, especially late in the game. So free throws are going to be key for this Bradley team. And that's something that's plagued them in, in the past. Uh, but, you know, I expect it to be a close game. So that's something they got to make sure they're getting those uh, easy points at the line. Now, I will say that Loyola also is not a very good free throw shooting team. They're shooting 68% at the line. And for a team as good as the Ramblers are, you really want to make those free throws, especially as you get in later into the season. Of course, this is an early MVC season matchup, but it's going to feel like a March type game. Could have big implications as we set the field for Arch Madness when we get into March. So, Definitely a big series. We'll have our eye on that again. Bradley hosting Loyola Chicago January 3rd and 4th. And guys, we, we look at the Missouri Valley Conference as a whole. I know it's it's early to be thinking of Arch Madness, but if we could uh, go through and give our power rankings, I think, you know, Bradley and Loyola have got to be right up there at the top, but Drake's got to be up there. And Northern Iowa, as we said, they've slid down a little bit. I mean, it's it's we're going to see a lot of jostling for position in the coming weeks. Yeah, 
We most certainly are, Joey. And looking at my power rankings, personally, I've got Loyola Chicago at number one. They're the only NBC team in the Ken Palm top 50. Then you've got Bradley because they've played such good competition. And like we said at the top of the show, really eight points away from being ranked. And if they had won those two games against Xavier and Mizzou, I really think they would be ranked and in the at-large conversation. So they're second in my power rankings. I think Drake is a shoe-in for the three spot, 12-0, and 0, of course. Anytime you're undefeated, it's kind of hard to not be in the top three. Then that four spot is kind of where things get dicey. I considered you and I because they split against a really tough Missouri State team. I think they're going to have a better year than they had last year. But you and I playing without its big star, obviously. But at the four spot, I'm going to have to go with SIU. They came out with that big victory at Butler. And, of course, they dropped a game to Evansville. Uh, and that game, you kind of just got to credit the Purple Aces for. I think SIU played well enough to win that game. But uh, that's just one of those things in the Valley where sometimes you play well enough to win and you don't win. Um, and we're going to see a lot of games like that when you have games on back-to-back -back days. So I've got the Salukis coming in at fourth. I'm interested to hear what. Uh... I have the same top four, just a little bit of a different order here. I got Bradley number one, and it might be a little home rush. I think they just have a little bit more depth than Loyola. Now, it will be interesting to see this first series because they've had a longer layoff, uh, obviously, with the COVID break, and they're coming off a tough loss. So they've been kind of sitting on that and stewing on that one for a while. So it'll be see interesting to see how they come out and play. But I think uh, Coach Warder will have them ready to go. So I'm going with Bradley one. I got Loyola two with a close second. Uh, I think Bradley looked a little bit better in the uh, out of conference uh, than Loyola did. The one lost to Richmond, they were favored by two points. Um, so obviously it's not the end of the world, but that's why I have them coming in at two. Then I got SIU at three. I think they've looked a little bit better. And Drake's strength of schedule, I, I – you know, it's subject to change, but they haven't really played anyone yet. Uh, so I'm waiting to see how they play against th this weekend, especially against um, better competition. So I'm going SIU three um, and then I'm going Drake four. You know, that's interesting. I don't really disagree with their strength of schedule. It's really been poor. But for me, what sold me on Drake is how they've beaten those teams. I mean, they're convincing wins. They're not squeaking out wins against bad teams. They had won all of their 10 games entering conference play by 10 or more points. And I think uh, Dickie V pointed that out on Twitter. He was the only AP voter to give the Bulldogs a vote. So shout out to Dickie V. He knows the Valley runs deep. Bradley does not play Drake until February 26th and 27th. It's actually the last series uh, as of right now that Bradley has. So we'll see if Drake is still uh, third and in uh, Larry's power rankings, or if, or if maybe he's maybe, maybe the Bulldogs have persuaded Mitch uh, by that point, but it, it's going to be a fun Valley, guys. And as we take a look at some other games from the second weekend of Valley play, we've got SIU at Drake and we've got Indiana State at Missouri State. Uh, who, who are we taking in that? Do we like Drake to, to keep rolling? I mean, do we like Indiana State to, to bounce back uh, after losing to Drake and, and maybe get Missouri State? I mean, how, how do we see this playing out? Well, based off of my power rankings, I think you know who I'm taking. Even though I said Drake was the most impressive in the opening weekend, I'm taking SIU over Drake. I think this is Drake's first real test of the uh, season. And I like how SIU performed in their out-of-conference play. An impressive win over Murray State, and they beat a traditionally a pretty good Butler team. Obviously, they're not that great this year, but that was still a pretty good win. They're coming off a stinker against Evansville. So they should be motivated coming into this one. I think good teams are coming off a bad loss like that. Uh, you tend so I'm going to make the easy pick here and say that they're going to split this series. You know, I'm sure that's a boring pick, but SIU, good team. Drake, also a good team. Like Mitch said, I think SIU has played better teams than Drake has. And also, like Mitch said, this is probably their first real test, and they're on the road at Drake. So I think the Bulldogs have that home court advantage. Uh, they played really well at home traditionally. So I think that will at least – be enough to get them one win and then SIU will squeak out one game I think I, yeah I don't disagree I think I could see that splitting I think SIU will look better in the split than Drake so before they're getting my head. yeah but I, I yeah I forgot about that aspect I guess yeah I can see them splitting very easily and guys how are we feeling about Missouri State and Indiana State you know that's going to be a fun one Indiana State you know they're, they're kind of a sleeper team I feel like this year and Missouri State as Larry said much improved in 2021 
Um, well, Joey, this one's a tricky one, and I'm going to go with the easy pick again. I'm going to say they're going to split. Um, I think Indiana State has enough talent to at least break 500 in Valley play. Whether or not they will do that remains to be seen. Um, but I, I think the Bears are going to be a very interesting case to watch this year in the Valley. We saw them with very high expectations last year, and they dramatically underperformed. I think the case there was they had just a hodgepodge of transfers and something didn't work out. You know, maybe there was, wasn't enough basketball to go around. Maybe players got selfish. I think we saw a lot of that Uh, this year. They've got a little more of a low key squad, some Juco transfers, a few players who have been in the program for a number of years. So I like the bears to finish ahead of their nine and nine record from last year. We'll see. Um, But Bottom line, I think they win one game. I'm taking Missouri State over Indiana State in a clean sweep this one. I think they're taking both games. Missouri, as you said, talented team, a lot of returning players. So they had kind of a year under their belt, uh, mesh somewhat after last season's debacle. And Indiana State, they're going to have their hands full with Isaiah Mosley and Gage Prim, especially Prim down low. Uh, I like he's, – he's a glass eater, and he can get you a lot of inside uh, buckets and second chance uh, points with offensive rebounds. So I think they'll have their hands full with those two. Certainly, it's going to be a, a fun series to watch. Both series are going to be, you know, some fun to watch as Drake looks to keep their, their run going and Missouri State and Indiana State grapple for territory. So, guys, about out of time. I want to double back to Loyola, Chicago, and Bradley once more before we wrap it up. Picks to click. Who steps up for the Braves against the Ramblers? Joey, real quick for me, I've got Ari Boya on the inside. The Braves need him to have a great series and lock down Cameron Crutwig especially on the defensive end. We've seen what he can do on the offensive end in flashes this year, especially against smaller teams. And Boya has the size advantage on Crutwig. So I'll be interested to see if the Braves kind of go inside and pound the rock, but where they really need him is on the defensive end to make sure he's not able to pass and score at will. I'm going with Deshaun Henry as my pick to click for this weekend. He's second on the team in points with 11.6 per game, which is kind of nice that they have some uh, another scoring option. They don't have to lean as heavily on Elijah Childs. He's also third in averaging rebounds. He's fourth uh, in offensive rebounds as well, which I think is a big stat. I love the energy guys that can get you offensive rebounds, especially when he's not – uh, a big center guy like that. So uh, another guy, he can jump out of the gym too. So you're going to get you a lot of second chance points, which is helpful. And he's fifth on the team in blocks. So, you know, for a guy that's, you know, not as tall as the RA boy is in the world, he's being getting you blocks. He's getting a lot of re- rebounds and he's scoring points at 11.6 per game. Uh, not too shabby. So I think he's going to have a big game uh, this weekend or a couple big games, I guess I could say this weekend against uh, Loyola. My pick, if I could make one, would be Jason Kent. I'm excited to see if he can keep up the uh, torrid pace that he showed against Missouri. You know, had a, had a big game, really helped the Braves uh, down in Columbia. So if I could make my pick, it would be Jason Kent. I'm curious to see if, if he keeps, uh, keeps up his strong trend of, uh, of you know, really just one really good performance this year. He's played a couple of minutes off the bench, but excited to see what he can do against the Ramblers. So guys, that'll, as I said, about do us for time. Uh, any final thoughts as we kind of wade into the deep waters that will be the Missouri Valley Conference this season? Briefly, I will say we haven't mentioned Elijah Childs once this show, and I think he deserves at least a mention. You want to talk about a guy who's hungry. He really wanted to win that Mizzou game. So I think he's going to come out with a chip on his shoulder as he almost always does in this Loyola series. I can't wait to watch. Joey, I thought you brought up a good point with Jason Kent. Unafraid to take big shots uh, for a freshman, too, in a big Mizzou game. So that'll be interesting to watch, too, in this Loyola one. Obviously, one of the bigger uh, conference games this year. So I like the fact that he's not afraid to chuck one up, uh, especially late in the game. So hopefully he keeps shooting and uh, keeps up the hot pace he's on. Well, the Braves will need it as they, as they, as I said, wade into the the deep waters of the Missouri Valley Conference. That's I like that. I like that turn of phrase. <laughs> but uh, guys, that'll, as I said, that'll do us for time. It's been great to uh, hop back on and, and preview games once more. You know, 2020, and I, I predict 2021 will be much the same, and and that we don't quite know what we'll get until we get it. But uh, we're going to keep going either way. So for our executive producer, Jacob Steinberg, I'm Joey Wright with Larry Larson and Mitch Kaminsky. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Bradley Men's Basketball Pregame Show.